This is Father Patrick Briscoe. And this is Father Jacob Bertrand Jancic. Welcome to God's Planning. Thanks to all of you who support us via Patreon. We're very grateful to our supporters who allow our project to go on. If you have not considered being a Patreon benefactor, we ask, ask that you would consider to do so. Please be sure to like, subscribe, and follow the podcast on our social media and wherever you listen to your podcasts. Father Jacob Bertrand, how are you today? Oh, all the better for your asking, Father Patrick. Thank you. Well, I just sort of figured on the podcast here that you would be willing to really open up and oh, share I always with us do the deepest, very vulnerable secrets of your soul. <laughs> Only on the podcast do I do that. That's right. Yeah. yeah, because that's well, that seems that it would naturally be the place, right? Of course. You know, when you're going through something, that you would just Dear spill listeners. it all out there. <laughs> <laughs> to the yeah. whole world. That's right. Well, I don't think podcast. the whole world listens to our podcast, well, but you, you know, know. We're getting, we'll, 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 <laughs> we'll work on it. That's a, that's why it's important that people subscribe, like, and share the episodes. That so they we enjoy. can buy more listeners. And so that they can know what's in the secrets of your heart, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe next time. Maybe next maybe time. Maybe next time. Okay. Yeah. Well, since we're not going to listen to the secrets of Father Jacob Bertrand's heart today, what we do have prepared is an episode on the Wizarding Universe of Harry Potter. Dun, so dun, dun. <laughs> exactly, there should be some really what are great they music say? there. Yeah, <laughs> I think that uh, well, one of the things that I I think that we have to start the place where we have to start right is that this was. I don't want to exaggerate, and I certainly don't want to speak for you because you'll correct me very quickly if I try to do so. <laughs> I'm only after the truth here, Father. <laughs> but it seems that for most millennials, how about I say this? It seems that for most millennials, Harry Potter was the book of our childhood. I mean, this was the this was the the lingua franca. It was the thing that everyone read. I think that's probably true. I remember we were, yeah, because we're the same age. I think when the first book came out, we were in sixth grade. I think, yeah, something like that. Younger, maybe. I remember my history teacher, my social studies teacher in sixth grade, would read us from the first Harry read to us from the first Harry Potter book, and then I remember. So maybe it came out like when we were in fifth and then, you know, that, that time frame. So when we were young, um, I mean, we're still so young father, you know, but when we were, <laughs> when we were even younger, but it's certainly through, I, and I remember in high school, which is, um, that some of my friends would do the whole dress up thing for the book releases, releases yeah, that's right. not just the movie releases. Now let the record show. I never dressed up for a release or anything <laughs> of Harry Potter. I just only started dressing like a wizard when I entered religious life. Nice, that's <laughs> yeah, good, yeah. That's, I can, you know, yeah. So. But before then, totally, no, totally, you know, no costumes. Okay. No, yeah, not at all. Neither did I. I do recall at one point uh, standing in line at a bookstore for one of the books. Okay. And then later, in later years, my mother had gotten a pre-order and was able to pick one up. I mean, but it was a big deal. Yeah. Like waiting for the book. It's like and the, the Devil Wears Prada, right? That's the book that she has to get for Meryl Streep, right? <laughs> Did you ever see that movie? Okay. Uh, That's embarrassing. Let's move of on. Things that we're not going to admit on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> the secrets of our hearts stay in our hearts, yeah. Father. Okay. We don't Well, you know what? Everybody forth. else will say, yeah, that's podcast. right. And you can just make fun of me. So, but I think from the, I think for the very beginning when the book, when the books were being released, when people were waiting for lines, whether in costumes or not, right. uh, mm -hmm. when people were waiting in lines to get their copy of the books as they came out, uh, the, the books were immediately controversial in Christian circles. Yeah. I think we can say that right yeah. away. Mm -hmm. um, anything in particular you remember about that controversy or or, or or how can we kind of frame this for our, yeah. for our listeners? Because people who have clicked on this episode have done so probably because they're either strongly invested one way or the other in Harry Potter and they want to know where the friars of God's planning fall. Yeah. Well, if you want to know that, I think that's, um, at least as we'll talk about, it might be revealed that we have similar but differing opinions or at least within the range like i think you and i even share kind of whole different opinions on certain aspects of the book mm -hmm. but at least to answer your question um the the sort of controversy is a very simple one and that's just pertaining to one of the cent central realities of a, like a wizarding world the non-muggle world is that the the book uses magic and our faith is very clear that the use of magic is is a grave evil. Um, so the question, like the, the question, then remains is, or the question, or the controversy arises. Perhaps that's a better way to say it. Um, if these books are premised on a world that exists in magic and uses magic, casting spells and these sorts of things, um, is it a good thing? 
in, in a particular way, like your comment about us growing up with as these novels and then as the movies were coming out, is it a good thing for children um, to be reading? So I, I think that's the bare right. bones kind right. of question where you have people coming down on either side. No, because of the content of magic, particularly Christians, this is not. A, uh, an okay thing uh, or yes it is an okay thing and i think we'll, we'll talk about that a little. but that's that's where the dispute lies and i don't think that's really a surprise to anybody but that's kind of where the dispute lies yeah, and you've seen over the years some some different aspects of this controversy how this conversation about whether or not the books are, are actually suitable um to be read in the confines of the catholic faith you've seen the you've seen this play out in in instances and in stories where for example in catholic schools the books are pulled from the library yeah. Or you get you get one off comments like um, Father Gabriel Amors, the famous exorcist, Rome Rome based exorcist, uh, Rome based. I think so. He's he's called like popularly the Pope's exorcist. Father okay. Gabriel Amor. Yeah. Um, he has a pretty clear condemnation of the books. Um, interestingly, Cardinal Ratzinger in the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith replied to a German author. Um, presumably he he knew her. Um, and she had done she had been doing some work on the Harry Potter books. Um, and as, as Cardinal Ratzinger, he said that it was important um, for, for points within the books to be clarified so the people didn't get the wrong impression about the Christian faith from the outset. So what, what he exactly said, and it's, a, it's worth listening to word for word, what Cardinal Ratzinger then said was, it is good that you enlighten people about Harry Potter because there are subtle seductions which act unnoticed and by this deeply distort Christianity in the soul before it can grow properly. And then when he was elected Pope Benedict, <laughs> that quote was taken out of context and blown up. And there was a, there was a controversy in certain uh, spheres of the Catholic internet saying Pope Benedict denounces Harry Potter books. Maybe you remember that. Um, yeah. So, uh, but that, that's clearly not exactly what, what he said in the quote. Um, so, Walk us through some of this, Father Jacob Bertrand. How how do you think um, how do you think we can begin to react to this question about about the use of magic and about and about exposing children to it um, in something like the Harry Potter series? Yeah, well, I think I don't think there is a what would I say a sort of unique pathway or like unique way to approach the Harry Potter novels, especially with kids. I think this, the, the sort of principles that we would lay out. And I think that the Holy father in that, in that short quote, um, was, was pointing to is that, um, as with everything, there's a certain level of engagement that ought to match the maturity of, of the person who's engaging with that thing. Right. So like we wouldn't give, um, we wouldn't give a, a child like, um, I don't know, like a, a, some sort of, I don't know, like Dostoevsky, like novel to start learning how to read a novel. Like you're just not there. You can't do that. You know, it's like, it's too complicated. There's too, it's too, even just, the, the, they aren't mature enough. They aren't old enough. They aren't, um, what, like their reading skills aren't developed enough. Like, you know, there's, this is common sense of how you bring a child along to learn things, but also a child ought to be accompanied and things need to be explained. And you can't just throw a book and say, hey, or a movie, that might be easier. Just put them in front of a, a movie and say, oh, go watch this and, and think that will have no effect in shaping them. Of course it will. Right. So with the Harry Potter books, with this question of magic and that sort of thing, and as the Holy Father was saying is, I would say that these ought to, you know, I wouldn't give, this is my opinion, I wouldn't give like, uh, you know, a fifth, sixth grader the Harry Potter series and just say, oh, go read them. They're, they're perfectly great. You know, there's nothing that needs my clarification. Your fifth grade mind will understand all the nuances perfectly well and then apply them perfectly well to your life. That's just not the case. That's not an exclusive thing to Harry Potter. You know, this is how you raise a child. You let them learn, you explain, you have conversation, you know, these sort of things. So I think if the novels are approached that way and they're being accompanied by good Christian education and formation and there's guidance and oversight, then that's solid ground. Yeah, I think that's a you, you. You bring up something that was kind of inherent in our in our opening, right? As we considered this, one reality that we all experienced from when the books were coming out is that we were growing up. Right, we were getting older, and so at the books, anyone familiar with the series knows that the themes grow in the books, and they become more and more mature. And uh, some of the some of the questions are heightened. You know, like as the as the students themselves, who are the major characters of the books, as they grow. They end up with questions about their own relationships, for example. Mm -hmm. So they say begin to have 
um, typical high school experiences as they date and so forth. Um, so there's a way in which we we were growing with the series, and I think coming to handle some of the more uh, adult themes or themes for older teens um, that are present in the later books because we were we, we were growing up alongside with them, right? And we didn't dump the whole series. But the, the whole series wasn't dumped on us as as young people. So I think there's I think That's there's something fair, to that yeah. um, th- that you're saying, uh, and especially about the need to accompany them. Uh, I think one one dangerous thing is when I, I think it's it's unnuanced um, when people dismiss the series out of hand just because there's a magical world. And then we end up, and then we end up, uh, you know, r- really stuck because of of great Christian works um, like Tolkien or C.S. Lewis that that are fictional worlds um, that do that do rely on a certain amount of magic. I mean, uh, Lewis and the Magician's Nephew is a great example of this um, for how Narnia, uh, the origins, the origin story of Narnia and how magic is used and controlled by characters in the book. Um, so we, so it seems that we're, we're sort of stuck, uh, in a way, if we dismiss a magical universe out of hat saying this isn't something Christians do. Um, but I do think we need us, we need to have a sensitive approach to the occult. And that's, the, that's the, one of the things that I'm hearing you say that I think really needs to be underscored. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's the reality that fiction is fiction. And the problem is, and this is leaving the occult aside for a second, we could talk about it, but the problem is when. Well, I think when inappropriately children are left to think that fiction is reality. Now, right, sure. kids have imaginations and they put, that's not what I'm saying. But when, you know, the idea that sort of just being able to manipulate people by casting spells is a way to deal with human relationships that are difficult, that's problematic. Now, does everyone who pick up picks up Harry Potter and reads, is that how they're going to react? No, but is that a potential pitfall by way of example? Sure. You know, so this is where I'm talking about, like, the company, the growth and virtue and, and, and these sort of things moving along as it's being read. Now, the occult thing is a very important point because, as we've said at the top of the episode, there isn't a time when use of the occult is a virtuous or a good thing in our lives. You know, we can't ever say that, like, it is good for me to cast a spell on somebody to do something or right. to, like to to go to like a medium to like predict the future you know right. but at the same time reading a book of fiction is a book of f- fiction now like you said does that is the, do we have to be sensitive to what fiction you know what tools and symbols are being used and in this case the occult and magic and yeah we do but does it have to be thrown out without a sort of um intellectual a nuanced intellectual approach to it i don't think so are there things, what kind of value do you see in this series? What kinds of things did you enjoy about it as a kid? You know, you read it several times through. Yeah, I've read it, no, and I've read it too as as a friar. You know, I don't know if as a priest I might have, but certainly in formation, I remember reading through the series. <laughs> yes. Yeah, gosh. See, there is that soul revealing going on in I this know, episode. I'm opening up. <laughs> um, I would say a couple things stand out, um, and uh, yeah, a few things stand out. I, I would... I would um, as be- not thinking about themes mm-hmm. so much, but mm-hmm. thinking about the people in in the book, um, one that really stands out to me, or, or I'll say two, is 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 the theme of or the reality of friendship mm-hmm. and self sacrifice, mm. um, or sacrifice for a higher good. I'll right. say that right. Okay. So the friendship thing we can see in a whole different host of um, layers and levels. So of course you have the trio Harry, Ron, and Hermione who are best friends. You know they. Uh, the whole kind of relationships that develop, they have their falling outs, they have their, you know, whatever, but you see this friendship and you realize very quickly, I think it takes Harry a bit longer to realize before the other two, but that like he can't accomplish what he's about to accomplish without them. Right. And then you have these extending circumstances, right? So you have like Ron's family, you have um, the professors that Harry grows close to, you have, the, you know, as as the novel develops, you have the his, 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 um, his godfather and all, you know, you have all these people that, um, that are involved in his life are friends in one way or another in, in true friendship, but you see the, the importance in the role of intimate friendship, close friendship, but also like having this reality there. The, um, and the other thing, the, the sacrifice thing, um, Harry of course sacrifices himself. If you haven't read it, spoiler sacrifices himself <laughs> at the end. Um, but the one that I, the two people that I, three people that I think of with respect to Four se- people three, you, uh, but I lump people. them together. Two of them are together are Ron and Hermione. Mm. Um, and there's one thing that Hermione does that I don't like at all, 
but I will say that in a second with respect to sacrifice, but also Professor Snape. Yes. Um, his character, I, he's my favorite character. He's my, not because <laughs> Is he he's, a role model, <laughs> not because he's the head of Slytherin and all this, but I think like what he does, what he suffers and endures that nobody knows right. is, is very admirable. Um, Hermione and Ron are there the whole time through with Harry. The thing that I, that really, I think I just have a hard time with it is that remember Hermione, what she does before they go on their last mission with her parents, she erases their memory Oh yeah, of her, yeah. yeah, of her to protect them. Which never comes back. Yeah. That like, I don't know. That's tough for me. Mm. That's tough. So, but nonetheless, that those things stand out to me. Yeah, and to those, I would add, um, they there there are real moments in the book where the characters um, who are relying on this friendships in particular demonstrate great courage. Mm -hmm. And I think that courage is one of those virtues that um, is misunderstood because when we talk about it today, it usually. Um, falls out in a moment of great self-expression, like, oh, you're being so brave because you told us this thing about yourself. Um, but real bravery um, is in the face of a principle or in service to a higher good, as, as you mentioned, um, with self-sacrifice. And so I think there's, some, there's something true about the courage that the characters are demonstrating. They're not just being authentic to themselves. or they're, right. you know, they're, they're, not, they're not pursuing their own ends. They're pursuing a cause that is greater than them. And I think that this exists in a, in a world that has, um, you know, a, a providential design, I would say, uh, that, there, that, that in the contest of good versus evil, uh, things are aligned for the forces of good to come out in the end. The, you know, there's a guiding hand behind that. And the, the real argument that I would make to build that up, to flush that out a little bit, is to point to all of the chance circumstances that fall Harry's way mm -hmm. and like time and time again in the book, um, the, 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 the order of coincidence is just so incredible that it's difficult to believe that it's just happening. Now, part of that's the, the nature it's of fiction, fiction, right? It's a book, yeah, yeah. it's a story yeah. and you, you, you want unbelievable things to happen to your hero. And that's part of what makes it a good story. Right. But the number of things that just, again, break Harry's way, I think are really extraordinary and they demonstrate a kind of moving, guiding providential force. I think that's beyond, just the author, uh, yeah. the author's hand in the story. So, so I think I think those two things. I think um, courage and and providence allow the characters to have a trust in things that are that are greater than themselves. And it's what, for example, allows Harry to trust Dumbledore. Um, and so there's so much in the latter books that Dumbledore does not reveal to Harry, and that requires a, a great virtue of, of trust. And I think those 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 things have a have a big role um, to play in the spiritual life. Now, what about um, what about the world itself, the the fictional world of Harry Potter, the Wizarding World of Harry Potter? What else might we say about this world as Christians? Um, do you mean good or bad? You should go for it. Yeah, no. yeah. Um, there is so one of the things that stands out, and and it and it's something that is explicit in um, uh, in some of the in, in parts of the book. You you see this with. Um, Malfoy's family, Draco, the Malfoys, Draco Malfoy, mm -hmm. um, and then the Weasleys, Ron's family. Mm -hmm. is, there's this, there's, there is a real, um, Tolkien, not Tolkien, J.K. Rowling <laughs> does a, uh, a really phenomenal job, I think, of, of highlighting the good and the role of the family. And you see this throughout the whole wizarding world, right? Because they have all their family trees. There's all this lineage. There's this sort of like robust sort of existence of within this these kind of old world families and, you know, all this, which has its pitfall. But there, there is a goodness to that. Mm. But you also see in like it's in the Weasleys, this family that's kind of poor. They have too many kids. Their house is falling apart. Why? I don't know, because they could do magic to make a nice, nice house. That I never understood <laughs> that. Um, but, you know, like... But it's it's the family that unit that is actually functional and good and pursuing virtue and you know even when one of their uh, who is it um, uh, Percy right one of the brothers he kind of works for the Ministry of Magic and and kind of disowns the family for a while they they still wait for him to come back to the family you know but then you have the Malfoys where it's like this evil family where family like it's not it's not the same you see this dichotomy so I think the the sort and and of course Harry's parents their, you know, sacrifice for him, but also Harry's search for meaning in family and belonging and that sort of thing. So I think that like in that world, it's a good thing. Mm. In our world world, sometimes it's not. 
you know, like the family is attacked and, you know, so I think in, in comparison, there's, right. there's a real virtue that's, that's brought out there. Um, so that, that's one that stands out, I think. Yeah. I would, I would add to that, um, in addition to what, what you're saying about family life, um, you know, even, uh, outside of that, the, the even bigger principle of good versus evil, sure. that, that yeah. this is just there, this is the major theme of the book, right? And it's why, a, you know, a serious scholar like Jean Bethke Eelstein at the, um, University of Chicago, well, she's deceased now, but um, why she was able to say the Harry Potter book matters so much because it allows serious Christian scholars to ask real questions about good and evil. So that was her, that was her defense of the yeah. book. And I, and I think that's really the premise because you, you have someone who is enticed by, uh, I, by the search for identity, by the drive for power and mastery. Um, I, I would say that's what, what drives Voldemort. Um, and you have someone who who just is totally consumed by those things, and the book clearly denounces them. That that pursuit of um, of self identity, you know, to to the to the extent that it that it causes harm to other people, and um, the pursuit of mastery over others. Those two things are very dangerous, unchecked. And the book clearly condemns them and pits that against the forces of good. So so there's never any question really in Harry Potter um, about what's good and what's evil. It's kind of laid out in in a mode that is very refreshing. There are, there are good guys and there are bad guys in this mm-hmm. book. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's a great book because, yeah. it, has, um, because it has this clear definition of, of the moral universe, at least in that regard, um, uh, about there being an ultimate good and an ultimate evil, and the ultimate good vanquishes the, the evil. Right. Um, yeah, and you see this even like the light and darkness of even just how... Like mm-hmm. when, you know, Voldemort is, it's always dark. It's always shadowy. It's always, even the people who work for him there, it's, you think of like, again, if you go back to like the Malfoys and the Weasleys, like when you're in the Weasleys house, it's homey, you know, and then when you're in the, the Malfoys, it's just, it's like a dark dungeon layer, you know, even that kind of like on the nose typography is there. Um, and when, when Harry dies kind of, you know, when he's killed by Voldemort, when he greets Dumbledore in this sort of like, space between the afterlife and the world what color it's all white Dumbledore's all you know he's dressed in white his white beard is white you know so you have this light darkness thing going on throughout the the entirety of um and I I guess the what is that the Patronus spell that Mm. you know that is cast that that you have to think something you know of of some sort of good thought right but also it's whatever animal comes to protect you the form of an animal but it's also a light right you know, it's in the form of light that comes out. So you have this imagery throughout too that highlights the exact thing that you're talking about. There are many, you mentioned Patronuses, which I think are obviously a kind of quasi-Christian symbol, uh, either of a, a guardian angel or a patron saint, right? It mm. seems to me that, that that's kind of clear. You've got the four houses, which are the four evangelists. Um, there are a lot of hidden Christian symbols, I think, or the world of Harry Potter could only exist in a world that was informed by Christianity and Christian yeah. symbols. Um any others like that come to mind for you, obviously? Um, that's a good question. I think there are some, and this is where like your caution about the occult could be taken to, because often in uh, in like the magic world, they magic takes what is good with respect to Christianity and and corrupts it mm. and uses it. And sort of like even the word hocus pocus is that's not really used in Harry Potter, but just like we think like you know Halloween witches is from the mass from hoc est enum corpus meum, this is my body, it's the hocus pocus, you know, so this is, I think, your point about, like, being careful about the occult and, you know, those kind of things. So there is some of that negative Christian symbolism. In one of the books, uh, there's that sort of meal that's set up. There, there's the hol- a party, and one of the professors is hosting, and there's sort of, there's, like, the bread, the fish, and the wine that are rotting, you know, so you have these mm. classic, they're not classic Harry Potter images, but they're classic, like, magic images that you just, like, yeah, that could be. I mean, does a kid read that and automatically think, "Oh, this is a corruption of the mass"? Probably not. But is that imagery there? Yeah. But also, there's there's the beautiful imagery, right? Of of um, the sort of yeah, the Patronus, the the sort of the houses in in the college, even the way like the even the way Hogwarts is set up, it looks like this old cathedral city. You know, even just the shapes and and that sort of thing that looks like old Christendom. Like you can't miss those realities. So. They're, they're there and other and, and and even just like permeate through yeah mm. but so by way of conclusion father Jacob Bertrand Harry Potter what should we walk away with 
Um, I would walk away with the books. Nice. <laughs> yep. I've read them, I think, three times through and I've seen the movies. So I'm not opposed to them. I I think that um I, I think that just say like like any book, any work of fiction, especially as you said, as they develop more adult like teenage and adult themes as the book goes, we can't just say like kids can read it no problem. You know, they have all the tools to to do that well. It's like maybe some older kids, but you know, we if if it's in line and, and guided and that sort of thing, it's like great. I think there's a lot to offer and they're entertaining. They're great novels. So I think my, la my last conclusion would be don't be swayed for or against the work itself because of the politics of the author, right? Like there are those, sure, that, yeah. those that hear that JK Rowling is a trans exclusionary radical feminist and decide to cancel the books for that reason or to love them for that reason to give the, to give them more awards. And I think what we risk there is allowing the author's views or author's interpretations to make the, the work uh, merely a work of political speech. Yeah. And we, we have to res resist that. You know, when we encounter the books, we have to take them, you know, in face value, take what's written in the work and then interpret it ourselves as the reader. Um, and and I, I think that that's really a key. And that's one of the things that I would that I would hope that listeners of the podcast take away from this episode to to be encouraged to. Um, to be to be critical, to engage with the work critically, to recognize that there are great themes there, um, and to not be swayed by uh, shallow critiques. I would say that's fair. That's good. I agree. We've come out in consensus. <laughs> this is so beautiful. Amen. I'm so happy to accompany you. At core this core, you know. <laughs> Thank you, listeners who support us via Patreon for tuning into this episode and tithing to our work. If you'd like to support us, check us out on our website at godsplaining.org slash Patreon. Right. Exactly. Something like that. Mm. Exactly. Uh, if you have not already, be sure to like, subscribe and share the podcast. Your reviews in particular help new listeners to find us. Share this episode with you with someone who you think would benefit from it. And as always, we ask that you would continue to pray for us and know of our prayers for you. God bless. Mm -hmm.